So thank you for coming out. My name is Sean Webb. I go by the handle Ladera online. And uh, as people are coming in, I thought I would introduce Groff. As you all know, this is my lovely goat. He was born at BSD Can. And he, uh, he was born because I had tweeted, and it caused a tweet storm about how I was preparing for my ASLR presentation for BSD Can. And I, had and I had yet to sacrifice the traditional three and a half goats. So Alan Jude and a few others picked it up, and it was suggested that Alan Jude pick up a goat for BSD Can so that I didn't have to bring one through US Customs. So Groff was born, and he is my little baby. I love him. So, uh, <laughs> today's presentation is about uh, address space layout randomization, or ASLR for short. While people are filling in, I'm going to have a, an, a moment of arrogance and egotism. And I'm going to talk about myself. So, my name is Sean Webb. I'm a big fan of open source. And I've been, I was introduced to FreeBSD when I was a teenager. And I had joined a, an internet and online hacking community. And they introduced me to FreeBSD and how it's much more hacker-like than even Slackware. And I just fell in love from day one. I'm passionate about security. Um, I have been working in the security industry for the past few years. And my first introduction to security when I was about 14, 15 years old and introduced to the internet. Uh, a lot of you will recognize the names NetZero and Juno. Um, they offered free dial-up service if you agreed to install a piece of adware on your uh, computer that would um, dial in to, the, to their network for you. And then once you're connected, it would display some ads. Well, uh, I figured that you know, dial-up is precious bandwidth, and I don't want these big banners on my screen. It takes up a lot of bandwidth. So I, uh, I ran a hex editor and strings, and I found out how they were, what numbers they were using to dial in and how they did the authentication mechanisms. And uh, I was able to reverse engineer that and created my own dial-up script uh, to uh, to not have to deal with the adware. So um, from that day on, I loved security. You, you know, uh, taking a look at things and manipulating things that the original developers or designers never thought of. I've submitted a few insignificant patches to FreeBSD. I worked on setFACL, getFACL. I'm a maintainer of a few ports. Um, which are pretty much defunct now because I submitted them because they were, you know, they were my projects and I didn't want to maintain my own custom port entry. Maybe some people use them, but main, mainly I think it's just me. And uh, I, co I authored a tool called libhijack, uh, originally for Linux, and I ported it over to FreeBSD and spoke about uh, spoke about that at last year's BSD CAN. It's a tool that uh, makes runtime process infection and, run uh, and injection of shellcode and arbitrary shared objects extremely easy on Linux and FreeBSD. I'm the co-founder of the Hardened BSD project. I'll be talking more about the OpenBSD project at the end of the presentation. And to, uh, to satisfy my lawyers, um, or my employer's lawyers, rather. Anything that I say here, uh, any opinions, ideas, thoughts, implementations, projects, that kind of stuff, they represent me and me only. Well, actually, I'm representing Hardened BSD and Soldier X. Uh, Soldier X is an online security community, and uh, of which I'm a member. And uh, that nothing but nothing reflects any of my previous employers, current employers, or future employers. So what we're going to do today is we're going we're to talk, we're going to start out with some definitions so we're on the same playing level. And we're going to go through the, the history of ASLR. Um, thank you to Wikipedia University. And then we're going to talk about 
what FreeBSD has done well uh, uh, in security. And we're going to talk about what, what needs to, uh, what weaknesses they have and what needs to be done further. Since we're, implement, we're, since we're a little bit late to the game with ASLR, we have the unique opportunity to learn from others. FreeBSD is really the only enterprise operating system that does not have ASLR. So we can take this opportunity to learn from others, their implementations, and some of the social and political aspects of those implementations as well. We're going to talk next about how, AS, how we've implemented ASLR and how to use it on FreeBSD. Then we're going to talk about what's next to do, what's left, and then if time permits, because I've only got 45 minutes, a live demo. So security, what is security? It's what Mt. Gox and Sony have in common. They suck at it. Really, security is an, ever, is an onion. Of, it's ever-increasing layers of an onion that make everyone tear up. The more layers of security you have, the more time it takes an attacker to successfully exploit your system. Layers of security are called exploit mitigations. An exploit mitigation is a method or technique used to prevent the successful exploitation of security vulnerabilities. One such exploitation mitigation technique is called ASLR, Address Space Layout Randomization. ASLR is, uh, it, what it does is it randomizes the memory layout of a program. If you don't have ASLR on your system or don't have it enabled, your program is gonna tell the operating system where it needs to be loaded in memory. If it's not loaded at that place in memory, it's going to crash. It's not going to work right. Well, what ASLR does is it allows the program to tell the operating system, hey, I can be loaded anywhere. But, uh, you know, so load me anywhere, load me in a random spot, and I'll make do. I'll figure out where I am, I'll figure out where my variables are, where my functions are, and I'll make do. What ASLR helps protect against is very low level things. Um, buffer overflow attacks, integer overflow attacks, your very basic and low level uh, vulnerabilities. But uh, it does not help protect against higher level vulnerabilities such as uh, misconfiguring sudo or uh, PHP, LFI, or RFI vulnerabilities. Really, we're talking at, at a very low level uh, uh, vulnerability here. A lot of people get mistaken that uh, ASLR is the end-all be-all of security, that once you have ASLR that your system is completely secure, you don't need anything else. Well, that's not the case. There are techniques to break ASLR, so ASLR is not the end-all be-all of security, but it is a good first step. It is the good, one of the first layers that you need to apply in creating your onion of security. So a little bit of history. Uh, in 2001, the PAX team created a, a third party Linux uh, patch to the Linux kernel. And this kernel implemented, among other things, ASLR. To this day, the PAX patch is still distributed as a third party patch. So that was 13 years ago. A lot has changed since then. In 2004, OpenBSD started their work on implementing ASLR. They get everything except for PI support, position independent executable support. We'll talk more in depth about what a PI is later on. In 2005, Linux did something incredibly stupid, and they keep doing this, you know, even in nine years later, almost 10, they keep doing similar things. What they did is they they saw PAX's patch and they're like, oh, that's a neat idea. Well, we're going to rip off your work. We're going to dumb it down, make it less secure, and market it as more secure. There was a lot of politics and a lot of drama regarding that patch. And I'll talk about that later. In 2007, Microsoft introduced ASLR for FreeBSD, or for Windows Vista. 
Um, their implementation sucked for Windows Vista. They had some te technical issues and some other big gaping issues that, that have survived to this day. So we'll talk more in depth about that later. In 2007, Apple started working on OS 10, uh, ASLR for OS 10 and finished it in 2012. In uh, 2008, OpenBSD completed their implementation uh, for, with Pi support. So that was the technical base implementation, the technical implementation that was required to finish it up in 2004. Uh, in, actually, yeah, it was this year, I believe, with OpenBSD 5.5. So it took them 10 years to go from no ASLR to having ASLR fully enabled for all applications in base. And uh, that's understandable. They had a lot of work to do. And in fact, uh, you can see in 2014, Oliver Pinter, which I'm mispronouncing his name, he's from Hungary, and we Americans love to mispronounce names. Uh, he, uh, he and I submitted our patch to FreeBSD. We've been working on it for over a year now. And so it's gonna take us a lot longer to have full ASLR on FreeBSD. I'm gonna guess another few years of work. So what FreeBSD has done well in the security industry is that they've done a lot of policy-based, policy-driven security. They have the MAC framework in Capsicum. Um, the MAC framework is, is really awesome, really extendable. And Capsicum is a sandboxing framework uh, that you have to integrate with in your applications. A developer needs to integrate with in, in his, his or her applications. They have NFS v4 and POSIX ACLs, so uh, file system ACLs that, that drive security policy. They have secure level, uh, which, which helps with the kernel, um, so that you can't chain, you can only do certain things if, if the secure level is set. You're forbidden from doing certain things. And audit disk D, which, which shares, which sends all your audit logs off to a, another server so that if an attacker compromises your system, your audit logs are off on a different server that hopefully the attacker can't, can't get to. You can think of containerization technologies and uh, virtualization technologies as a form of policy-based security. If you don't trust your application, then chances are you're gonna to wanna to run it in a, in a container or in a virtual environment. Uh, FreeBSD does have two, um, two non-policy-based security technologies, one of which is a, an exploit mitigation technology, and that is the non-exec stack. Prior to, uh, you know, way back in the day, back when Aleph One wrote his uh, famous paper, uh, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit, he, uh, you know, they, attackers would store their shell code on the stack and get it to run on the stack. Well, it's really popular nowadays for, uh, for servers to have the stack as non-executable. So that is uh, an exploit mitigation technique that no longer an attacker can, can store and run their shell code on the stack. Ptrace restrictions, Ptrace is awesome. I love it, that's what libhijack uses. Pretty much makes you god mode um, uh, in regards to exploiting or manipulating other processes. So what FreeBSD needs to improve on is that it needs to enable the non-exec stack on all architectures. The non-exec stack is only enabled by default on AMD64 and i386. It is not enabled and not even functional on ARM. Um, uh, so we need to get it enabled on more architectures and working on more architectures. We need position independent support, independent executable support in base. Uh, we had a patch, uh, I had actually committed, well, I didn't commit, uh, I had upstreamed a patch to FreeBSD that enabled uh, position independent executable support. There were uh, issues with that patch and later it was reverted. So 
Um, we need to revisit that and re-implement it. Of course, there's no ASLR in FreeBSD. That's why this presentation exists and why you're here. And there's another third-party uh, patch to the Linux kernel that hardens both the Linux kernel and the, and the user land called GR Security or GRSEC for short. And my end goal is to port all features of GRSEC to FreeBSD. That meant the, one, the features that make sense for FreeBSD, at least. So we have the opportunity to learn from others, and we're going to learn from Linux today. Linux developers love politics. I think they love it more than actually developing. Um, what they did is they took Pax's patch, which is awesome. It's 13 years old, and it's undergone a few changes over, over, over the past 13 years, but by and large, uh, the underlying technique uh, that he is using has, has withstood the test of time. Well, the Linux developers ha took his patch, completely ripped it out, and dumbed it down, imported their dumbed down and less secure version into the Linux kernel, and then marketed it as more secure. I remember distinctly all the drama that happened with that. I was about to leave the security industry for the security scene for about two years, and that had just barely gone on right before I left. And I remember that as if it were day and night, as if it were yesterday. Linux's ASLR has weaknesses. They're not randomizing enough bits, and they're not ran randomizing them in the right way. And there's only one way you can, you can, if you have a misbehaving application, if you have a closed source application, we'll take Flash for an example. Flash does work, but I'm going to pick on it because I hate it. Um, you know, if, if Flash were to misbehave under ASLR, you would have to turn ASLR off for your whole system because you wanted to run Flash. That's not okay. That means for one application, you have to remove all security in your system. Well, not all, but, you know, a good, a good important piece of security in your system. And non-root users can disable ASLR for their applications. All they have to do is call fork and set a special personality, say, in this newly forked process, I don't want to randomize my, my environment. And then after, so it's fork, set the personality, and then exec VE. So that's really stupid. Non-root users should never be able to disable ASLR. Windows. So Microsoft today, with Windows 7 and especially Windows 8.1, has a really good implementation of ASLR. They're randomizing enough bits, and they are randomizing them in the right way. Um, but the problem is, is that individual DLLs that, a, that an executable might import can have ASLR turned off. So this was the case with a major software vendor whose name I will not mention, but they are used pretty much every day by a lot of people to look at documentation and to modify graphics files. They had shipped uh, within this last year one of their, uh, one of their uh, applications to generate documentation. And, uh, and this application had ASLR turned on for the executable itself and for all of the DLLs it imported, except for one DLL. And because of that one DLL, so what happens is Windows will load that executable with ASLR turned on and all of the DLLs with ASLR turned on, except for that one DLL. So uh, AS ASLR, that one DLL will be loaded in a deterministic way. That means that the attacker is now able to uh, generate uh, exploit payloads based off of that one DLL because it's loaded in a deterministic way. Every single time that that program is loaded up, 
it's going to be loaded at the same exact address. It's going to be loaded in the same exact way every single time, even across reboots. So, uh, so that that software vendor had 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 done that. They they released their application. They had a vulnerability in a DLL that was randomized that had ASLR turned on, but because of the one DLL that had ASLR turned off, they were uh, attackers were able to successfully exploit their application relatively easily. They didn't need to do any anti-mitigation techniques. They just keyed off of that one DLL and they were able to pop a shell. Fortunately, Microsoft has this tool called Emmet, and version 5.0 was released uh, just, a, a, just within the past few months. Emmet is a tool that, that makes it so that you can force ASLR on and other exploit mitigation technology features uh, on all the time, for, even for applications and DLLs that say, I don't support ASLR, you can still force ASLR to be turned on for those applications and DLLs. So that's a really good, really great uh, product there, and it's free. And if you run Windows, I highly recommend, as does everyone in the security industry, I highly recommend you run Emmet, and you run it in enforcing mode. But what we learned is that ASLR is not the end-all, be-all of security. You know, it's, it's a good first step in exploit mitigation technologies. You can bypass ASLR using techniques called blind, uh, using a technique called blind drop. It's a technique that was uh, published uh, earlier this year at the Black Hat USA conference. And uh, so it's a relatively new technique. And it's, it's kind of a little bit error prone. You have to try it a few times. Your victim application, your target application, might crash while you're trying to generate uh, dynamically ROP payloads. But, um, but it's, it's a technique, nevertheless, to, to, to get rid of, to bypass ASLR. So really what we need, the thing that we can take away from Windows is that we need a combination of exploit mitigation technologies. We, we're, not going to, we're not going to stop once ASLR is finished. Oliver and I are not going to stop there. We're going to continue working on adding exploit mitigation technologies to FreeBSD. And Microsoft has proven that that is absolutely required. So to introduce ASLR and FreeBSD, we support all architectures that FreeBSD supports. We, we, we're kind of limited right now because we're doing this out of our own pocket. and. Um, we have, of course, AMD64 boxes and i386 boxes. Um, I have a, a, a BeagleBone Black and a Raspberry Pi. Um, the BeagleBone Black was donated to me by Soldier X, uh, as well as a Spark64 box. ASLR on ARM is broken, and I'm looking for help from people who know ARM well. Um, if you want to talk to me about the ARM breakage, um, uh, see me after this presentation. Well, see me once the conference is over because I want to see Ed Mast's talk next about LLDB. That looks really interesting. Um, but, uh, but ARM is broken pretty much, and it's due to the stack. It's due to the stack and signal delivery. Um, we can talk about that more later. Spark 64, I couldn't get a FreeBSD head box, uh, a FreeBSD 11 current box, just vanilla running on Spark 64. I have an old Spark box donated to me by the same, uh, the same people, the Soldier X community, um, and, but it's old, and um, I couldn't get FreeBSD, the vanilla FreeBSD running on it. So we support uh, exec base randomization for position independent executables. And we support basic address layout randomization for executables that aren't compiled as a PI. Um, 
and we support per gel ASLR settings. So what a PI is, a position independent executable, is it's it's an application that is compiled in such a way that it can it tells the operating system that I can be that it can be lo loaded anywhere in memory. Traditionally, your application will tell the operating system, like I said before, that the that it expects to be loaded at a certain place, and that is due to how the ELF file format works. Um, there's nothing we can do to change the ELF specification. That was created a long time ago by Sun. Um, over 20 years ago, I believe. And so, uh, so you, in order to make full, um, in order to make full utilization of ASLR, you have to compile your application as a PI, as a position independent executable. We have the reverse problem that Microsoft has. Microsoft has a problem where individual EXE or DLLs might have ASLR turned off. We have the problem of uh, an application itself might have ASLR turned off, but its shared objects that it depends on, or its DLLs, so to speak, that it depends on, um, uh, will have ASLR turned on. And we can't, there's no way that we can turn ASLR off for individual shared objects. And that's because of how the ELF spec works, uh, how the ELF file format works. And that works out in our favor. Favor. So uh, when you when you compile your what you have to do is you have to compile your kernel with a custom uh, option, uh, the PAX ASLR option, and uh, when you you uh, when you do that, you'll have these these knobs, these tunables that you can tune at boot time via bootloader.conf. And, uh, and this is actually defaulted to two now rather than one um, in our implementation. And when you look at the help, when you look at uh, the help for those tunables, uh, you'll see why it's zero, one, two, and three. There's different things that you can set. So the status sets whether it's, whether it's enabled, whether you want ASLR enabled. Debug is self-explanatory. The MMAP len, that's how many bits of, of, of address space are we going to randomize when MMAP is called. The stack length is the same thing except for the stack. How many bits of the stack are we going to, are we going to randomize? And the exec base, the exec len, is how many bits are we going to randomize of the exec base of the position independent executable, where that position independent executable, the base of where it's loaded. So what happens when, an when you have an application that doesn't support ASLR? It crashes or it misbehaves, it exhibits bugs. Well, what you can do is you can jail it. You can, you can, set, you can put that application inside of a jail and, uh, and have ASLR turned off just for that jail. So you have ASLR turned on for everything else uh, but except for that application or applications in that jail that don't support ASLR. And that's how we, we learned from Linux that we don't want one knob to rule them all. We want to be able to be flexible and, and, and support um, having security mitigation techniques, exploit mitigation techniques, um, uh, be enforceable on a per jail basis. So what we do is there's, there's a few different ways you can implement ASLR. You can either sacrifice a lot of performance and, and have a, an extremely secure uh, uh, version of ASLR, implementation of ASLR, or you can, you can sacrifice a little bit of security for performance, for a lot of performance. And what we did is we took Pax's patch, or we looked at his documentation, and we went the performance route, um, which is the route that he goes with that has withstood the, the, the past 13 years. 
So what we do is we use deltas. We have calculated what we do is we, when a process executes, we generate three different deltas, which you saw from those knobs. The MMAP delta, the stack delta, and the exec base delta. And so these deltas are applied in different places. So these deltas are calculated once, and any time you call MMAP in, in a specific way, the delta is applied. So we're not consistently, for every single mapping, we're not consistently calling into the pseudo random number generator. That is one way to do it, but that is that would cause major issues with performance. Your, your computer would slow down to a crawl. So using those deltas helps us with performance. And we, don't, we do lose a little bit of security there, but um, it's negligible. Uh, so uh, PAX's implementation does the same thing, and it hasn't been defeated yet. Um, other than, you know, blind ROP is a technique to defeat ASLR. There's no real way to defend against that except through other, other completely different mitigation techniques. So um, the, one of the problems with position independent executables is that they set their uh, exec base in their headers uh, to a null. So what happens is when you're, when you're calculating this delta, zero is a completely... Uh, valid random number. And so our implementation guarantees that null will never, ever, ever be used as, as the exec base. So, um, so, so we guarantee that uh, null mappings will never be reached. And so what we're going to once we have this ASLR in the base system, once it's been fully upstreamed, we're going to next work on uh, reworking that PI support that we, um, that, we, that we had committed and reverted before. We're going to rework that and redevelop that. So how to use it? First, first of all, you compile your kernel. So you need a custom kernel. Uh, and you have to compile it with the PAX ASLR option. By default, because, this is, because ASLR touches a whole lot of different places in the Linux kernel, and especially since it's per jail, uh, we have decided to make it opt-in by default. So you have to, you, well, not opt-in, you have to compile a custom kernel. It is disabled by default in the generic kernel. Um, once you do that, you'll get this, uh, you'll get the tunables that are set via the bootloader.conf. So if you need to change these tunables, you have to reboot, which is really good if you're, you know, if you're, if you're an attacker and you want to turn ASLR off, you have to you reboot, which is probably going to cause Nagios to, to yell at the system administrative team, the DevOps team, and it's going to set off flags on the network. And uh, there is another uh, uh, kernel option, the PAX sysctls option, that allows you to have these, these knobs exposed uh, while during runtime, so you don't have to reboot. But it is less secure. So when you do compile your kernel with the PAX ASLR option, you have to... Uh, uh, it is enabled by default, so ASLR will be enabled by default. And uh, child jails will inherit the parent, parent jail settings. So you know how you can have uh, multiple levels of jails where a jail, a jail might have a child jail? The child jail will inherit the parent jail settings. So if you have uh, ASLR turned off in the parent jail, then when you boot or when you start the, the child jail, it will start with ASLR turned off. So to, to add support for applications to be compiled as a PI, you have to compile them with certain flags. The C flag that you compile with is dash F PI, all one word, and the PI is capitalized. The LD flag that you have to set is dash PI, with PI all lowercase. So um, our ASLR implementation is, is 
just a very basic implementation um, as far as what, as far as how far along it is. I am currently researching how to randomize PS strings and the uh, VDSO. Um, that's going to take a lot of work, and changing and randomizing PS strings might break ABI and API. Um, there is potential for that. I'm still researching it, but there is potential for that. It's a major change, and it needs to happen. Otherwise, um, otherwise the ASLR implementation won't be 100% complete. Um, the VDSO needs to be randomized as well, because even though it's tiny, you can still generate maybe a couple, a few ROP gadgets out of it. Um, and uh, one thing that OpenBSD does that I really like is that they randomize the order of loading shared objects. So, um, so I really like that. I need help with ARM. Um, I am kind of a busy guy, so um, I've been trying to learn ARM in my spare time, uh, but my spare time is limited. So I haven't been able to, to fix the bug. I know what's going, I know the symptoms, but I don't know the cause. We need a lot more people to test this. I've done a few call, calls for testing on the mailing lists, um, and we've gotten some good feedback. I've been running our ASLR patches in production for over a year now, and I have had zero hiccups, zero problems. So we are at a stable point, and we have uh, a nightly cron job that makes sure that it merges still, that our work still merges in successfully with FreeBSD head. And of course, once ASLR is completed and Pi is completed, we're going to work on uh, porting over more GRSEC and PAX features. So the Harden BSD project, we, Oliver and I, started this. Uh, we, we put in some of the foundations of it last, uh, late last year, and we made it official uh, just uh, a month or so ago. The Harden BSD project is a fork of FreeBSD, and it's pretty much, it aims, its goal is to serve as mainly just a staging area for us to do our, our development of these security projects and, and have just a place to wait for these patches before they're fully merged upstream. Now take that with a grain of salt because there are some things that we, aren't, we are not going to upstream. Um, there are some changes that we just, it just doesn't seem like a good fit for the free BSD project as a whole, but does seem like a good fit for hardened BSD. So um, uh, we've already implemented one change, and that is a, a sysctl, a, a knob, that allows you to disable the map 32-bit functionality uh, for AMD64. Um, because that, that can be used and mis- uh, and, and abused to, um, to and, and may cause some security vulnerabilities. We are slowly becoming a more complete downstream dis distribution of FreeBSD. We're working on getting an automated build infrastructure. Uh, we're about 90% complete there. And, uh, and we're working on uh, doing weekly uh, Poudrier builds um, and nightly builds of, of head. So um, we have five developers, and three of them are, are active daily. That would be me, Oliver, and, uh, and David Carlier, who is in France. So uh, Harden BSD is coming along great. Uh, we, have, we, um, we have Cha Cha now implemented. Uh, like uh, like what Tom was it Tom? Ted, like what Ted was talking about, or not Ted Theo, Theo was the one talking about it. Uh, sorry, too many things going on in my brain right now. Um, Theo was talking about Cha Cha and how they replaced their Arc Four implementation with Cha Cha. We've done the same, but for FreeBSD. So. Um, 
uh, we are active daily. We're doing a lot of things. We've gotten quite a few patches uh, upstreamed already to FreeBSD. Um, David Carlier has, has been doing great work in, in getting his work upstreamed. So um, I want to say a special thank you to Oliver Pinter, who's been an amazing uh, person to work with. Uh, he's the co-founder with me on the Harden BSD project and an active developer. Um, and he was the, the person that originally started developing ASLR for FreeBSD. And I helped, I came in a little bit late to the project and added cool new things. Um, and Danilo is an, one of the other developers for Harden BSD. He has been working on another exploit mitigation technology called Seg VGuard. And uh, Ryan Steinmetz, uh, he's on the ports team. Uh, he's one of my coworkers at, at Cisco. And he had some really great ideas for adding, for integrating Pi support into the ports framework, which I have not done yet. But he had some really awesome ideas there. I'm going to murder this name since I'm American, but Johannes Mexner, um, uh, he convinced me to do some stuff about, uh, about publicizing the ASLR project and, uh, for, and to Soldier X for donating hardware. And, uh, and so thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? All right, well, thank you very much for, uh, for coming to my presentation. I really, really appreciate it. My, my slides are up on GitHub. So um, they're just a text file that you can read with any text editor. Um, so go ahead and visit my GitHub if you want slides. There's references for some of the vulnerabilities and weaknesses in different uh, implementations of ASLR.